Hello, my friend. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Pete, and we're talking about how to fix your program design systems. We speak to many gym owners all the time who have very unscalable, complicated program design systems that are costing you time and money every single day. So we walk through our program design pyramid and teach you how to build a scalable, effective program design system from the ground up. So if that sounds useful, keep on listening. Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. Uh, it's the new year and I'm back with Pete Dupuy. Hello, my friend. It's good to be back. 2024. Let's do it. Yeah. What are you looking forward to in 2024? Uh, our new podcasting protocols. <laughs> We're going to be crushing this podcast even harder in 2024. So we're to answer your question, though, I'm, I'm excited yeah. about Austin. I got to book my flights yeah. this afternoon. So yeah, let that uh, be your, your launching point if you want to talk yeah. Austin. Good transition. Look at us. Podcast is already crushing it with a clear transition. Um, before we dive into today's topic, which is really uh, how to how to how to streamline and scale your program design systems is um, I want to give you a quick reminder that we have a retreat coming up. It's in Austin, Texas. It's March 2nd and 3rd. It's really only for Unicorn Society members, but we open up 10 spots for non-Unicorn Society members. And if you let us know you want to come before January 14th, you get some early bird pricing. It'll never be cheaper. So go ahead and DM us on Instagram if you want more information. But all you need to know is that the whole retreat is going to be about marketing and sales. You're going to learn how to create high quality leads, how, how to effortless, effortlessly convert those leads. You're going to learn how to grow your revenue month over month. You're going to connect with like-minded gym owners. We have a special guest star, Jordan Syatt, who's going to be there. And so it's going to be an epic retreat. We're Pete, Mark, I, the whole team are going to be there. So if you want to join us, head over to Instagram, let us know, and we'll give you more information. That being said, let's dive into today's topic, which is all about how to make your program design systems not suck. So before we talk about the solutions and the things I think we can do to help y'all, um, Pete, let's just talk a little bit about um, your own experience at CSP and then talking to Unicorn Society members, how much we've seen people have program design systems that just honestly don't scale. So yeah, uh, talk to me about what you've seen in the, in the, the terrible end of this pool. <laughs> I think we're giving too much credit in assuming that people have systems, period. I think True. they have, they might have an approach, Yep. but I don't know that I've come across a whole lot of people who can tell me that they have programming SOPs mm -hmm. or they have kind of foundational rules. They all, the, let me correct myself. They all have them, but they're all in their own heads yeah. and, and putting things on paper that translate well, if you decided to say, sell the business or hire a bunch of people very quickly to accommodate a huge influx of leads uh there there aren't systems there are just kind of uh mental rules that that's need it. to end up on paper is kind of how i've seen it yeah that's the number one story i see with most gym owners is that the program design systems are a product of whoever the owner was and what their approach was to making programs it's mostly in their head they may only hold on to this task for as long as humanly possible uh, and it's because they do I say this with love, my listeners, um, they do just a crappy job of writing down what they do, why they do it, so they can delegate and hand it off to anyone else. So it stays in one person's hands, which is just not very scalable. And then they are frustrated by wondering, why can't I get my trainers to, to, to do what I do? <laughs> why can't I get my trainers to programming? Why do I have to do all the programming? It's like, well, you haven't made it a system. You haven't made a system that can be consistent and delegated uh, and then have good quality control to make sure it scales over time. So yeah, I've seen that time and time again. We've had that issue at MFF uh, throughout the years. Um, and I've seen it uh, with so many times with Unicorn Society members. So um, let's talk about our solutions. And we have a whole playbook for this for Unicorn Society members. And in that playbook is something we're going to walk through today called the Program Design Pyramid. And really, this is just kind of five foundational principles for how you create a program design system that scales. And then we're going to go through this and talk a little bit about you know how CSP does this, and hopefully, listeners, you leave here with an idea about how you can build a scalable program design system from the ground up. Yeah. Uh, and as we go through these kind of five components of the pyramid, um, the thing I want to stress to you is, is that when you decide all the answers to these questions I'll have to ask, your team has to be very aligned on this. Right? If all of your ideas about programming are stuck in your head, you're doing it wrong. And you might even need to trickle down to your clients. Your clients should know why you train why you train the way you train so let's dive in before i keep going so the foundation of this pyramid is what are your core beliefs about training what do we mean by this are what are your beliefs about your body about nutrition about 
movement, right? What are the things that you believe and don't believe are true? And are those beliefs clear to everyone on your team? Yeah. So, yeah, I know P obviously at CSP, uh, Eric's philosophies about movement and fitness have really been kind of baked into the DNA. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. So we hire exclusively through our internship program yep. puts us in a unique position there where I can ensure that if somebody's going to jump on the payroll longer term, they will have demonstrated 300 plus hours of competency and fit yep. and a big part of that competency is a complete understanding of our approach to program design and mm -hmm. uh, appreciation for how to execute it with a client and how to cue them through it. So we're admittedly not great about having a playbook per se internally. Sure. In, in the sense that I don't have a PDF that I distribute to the interns and say, <laughs> this is how you're going to learn programming. Yeah. However, John has baked it into the curriculum over the yep. course of a given internship. And so there are tons of programming touch points and we have a, we have a baseline framework as far as like the structure of a program goes, yep. you know, what the template is that everybody understands and works off of. Yeah. Beyond uh, that, uh, there are, Every single person who interns with us sits in on uh, assessments and they get the opportunity to revisit assessment findings with the coach after the fact, talk about what programming objectives might be coming out of it. Mm -hmm. But if you intern with us, you understand what the guardrails are, I guess sure. I'd say. Yeah, you understand what we consider to be taboo <laughs> from a programming <laughs> yeah, perspective. Exactly. We understand what the, the foundational movements are. You've seen them, you have an ability yeah to emulate what you've seen. But the key is, I think you need to have a real feel for what your avatar is. And you kind of need to have, say, three different iterations of a baseline program for your avatar. That could be a starting point. And yeah. we can individualize off that. But the, the thing that people think if they haven't been in a performance training facility like ours, and they hear us say, oh, we do individualized program design, they think that every time we sit down to write, write a program for, say, a Michael Keeler, we open up a blank slate and yeah, we're like, all right, let's, document. what's a one going to be? Let's, let's dream a little bit. Yeah. And that's just so operationally inefficient that it, yep. it doesn't scale in any capacity. So there needs to be an ability to make appropriate comps, like understand this athlete looks like this athlete coming in with this similar injury history. Let's start there as a baseline and build off of that. Yeah, if that exactly. And I think you're already talking about a, a point in a pyramid, which we're going to even get to and talk about in more detail, which is having a proven kind of process for writing programs. But so I think that's super valuable. But going back to the core question, which is like, what are the core beliefs you all have about training? And I'd say that, you know, even, you know, Eric's whole body of work, every video and article and all that serves as like source material for how you all think about working with your clients, which brings us to the next point in the pyramid, which is once you're clear about your core beliefs about training, then what's your approach? Like, what are the methods you're using, right? And the way we think about this is like, what are the methods you encourage, the training methods you encourage in your gym? What are the training methods that you discourage, that you only frown upon? What are the training methods that are freaking banned? That if you see someone doing this kind of training in the gym, someone's going to be pissed or in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's some unicorn center members we know that also go as far as to having um, certifications they require for everyone on their team. And they have affiliations of a lot of unicorn Society members that are, for example, like strong first affiliated. So, which means a certain percentage of their members are, you know, um, uh, have that certification. I'm sorry, their team has that certification. So I think your core beliefs have to be backed up by a specific approach that is consistent on the training floor. Yeah. So how would you describe like that approach for at CSP? Well, you've definitely pointed toward the fact that Eric inspired the initial kind of foundational approach to program design. So yeah. you're, if you come into our gym, you're going to see exercise pairings and supersets and, and you're going to see it all flow a very, in a specific cadence People are going to okay. come in, they're going to warm up. They're going to do some movement training. They're going to transition to the med ball area. They're going to throw some med balls. They're going to get into the weight room and they're going to lift some weights. And then they might find their way back to the warm up area for some repeated mobility stuff or something along those lines on the way home. But it's all informed by a program, a book Eric wrote called Maximum Strength back in 2006. That it's amazing. The, the structure yep. of a program in our gym hasn't changed for almost 17 years. Yeah. And yeah. The, That's a good the thing. content. Yeah, exactly. That's... So the there's continuity across both facilities. And in fact, we just felt this because 
we had interchangeable clients uh, during Christmas break. Yep. We had a handful of CSP Florida clients walk through the doors at CSP Massachusetts on less than three hours notice. And we had a handful of Massachusetts clients pull the same ridiculous move on Florida uh, down there. And what happened was, well, if a client showed up without a program in hand, mm -hmm. we have systems in place that allow us to access programming across facilities to okay. print copies and iterations. And from a client experience, they're interchangeable. In, down to the point where we equip our gyms the same way. You should yeah, be able to amazing. walk into CSP Florida as a Massachusetts client and intuitively understand where they probably keep the exercise mats, yeah, where they probably exactly. have the dumbbells situated. They are similar. They're not, they are by no means carbon copies, but there's kind of a logical approach to how the gym is laid out. And that actually informs the programming. I guess you could probably say that the layout of the gym is informed by the programming philosophy. Sure. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think it's a perfect example of the kind of system that you're building, that it does scale across multiple states, right? And people can come in and both locations and have a similar-ish program design experience. So, I mean, that brings us kind of to the middle of our pyramid. So we talked about the base of the pyramid here is having core beliefs about your training that are clear to your whole team, which is then informs the approach that you take, the method to use, the methods you don't use. And then on top of that, it starts to get real tactical. We talk about next, like what is in your exercise library? Like having an actual library of these are the exercises we do, these are the exercises we don't do. And when we think about all the exercises in our library, here's how we think about progressions and regressions. Here's how we as a team decide what's get added or removed from this library. And it's like that tactical piece where I see a lot of gyms just like are not on the same freaking page. And trainers mm -hmm. can at any moment go rogue Guilty. with any exercise they just learned on the internet last week. And then everyone else on the team has egg on their face when they get that program. And they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and so, you know, and you just gave some perfect examples of how you get everyone kind of on the same page by having you know clear templates which is actually i'm going to just move into the second the next part of a pyramid because the next layer of the pyramid is what is your proven process for writing programs and that's when we get into having templates that are shared across every trainer that everyone's mm -hmm. working off the same format and structure which as you said has been the same at csp for 17 years and it should be because it is the proven process that you use to get clients results time and time again and every trainer has got to be on the same page about that Yep. And in our space, that is giving everybody access to everyone else's programming efforts. Mm -hmm. It's giving everyone access to everyone else's assessment findings. And so that from a programming standpoint, a coach who didn't evaluate an athlete or write prior programs for them, but has just interacted with them on the training floor yep. on short notice can pull together a passable program. Yep. And I don't mean like, not doing right by the client, but I mean, pull together a program that is informed by information about the athlete that we have collected and systemized as far as making it accessible to everybody. Yeah. Um, and listen, I'll tell you a funny story about the, the program yeah. template at CSP that yeah, I don't please. know if I've ever told you. Uh, the book I mentioned, Maximum Strength, when Eric wrote that, I was in graduate school and he said, I've got a book coming out. Would you like to be a guinea pig on the programming? I've got a couple of people giving it a trial run and you can give feedback. And he sent me this atrocious Word document. I mean, it was, <laughs> I opened it up and I was like, this is, I, I can't print this and carry this around a weight room. This is offensive. So, and I had, my training age was zero. I had never lifted weights in any capacity up to that point. And so in the back of my economics classroom during grad school, as I was getting my MBA, I mentally shut out everything that was being taught. And I said, what would this program look like if I put it in a spreadsheet and yep. the information flowed logically and the exercise program template that you see in our gym. And at this point in countless other gyms, when you think of like CSP intern spinoffs who open their own mm -hmm. places or coaches from our internship program who went off to coaching college programs and built their own template. Like this template that has become kind of commonplace in a lot of uh, spots and in Eric's books were designed. It was all designed by a guy who had never lifted weights before sitting in the back <laughs> of a, a graduate level classroom. And I was just trying to make my own experience easier. But that, I mean, that is the entrepreneurial journey anyway. 100%. But whenever anyone picks up a CSP program, <laughs> that was not a reflection of countless years in a weight room. That was just logic from somebody yes. who had not had their 
fingers in it before. Well, honestly, Pete, I love that story so much because it just shows the the kind of rabbit hole that a lot of trainers find themselves in is because they're such a, um, a student of the craft. They have a hard time pulling themselves out of it and be like, how do I make a tool that is helpful to a Pete on day one of lifting weights, right? But the fact that you brought that kind of beginner mindset, those fresh set of eyes, meant that you were uniquely qualified to make a tool that's good for people who are just stepping into that program for the first time. And I think more of our listeners probably need someone like you, right? To take a client who's brand new and be like, how would you organize this in a way that makes sense for you? Like, Yeah, the beginner's really mindset's right. huge. When I walked into the gym that night and Eric saw it, he said, what is that? And I said, this is maximum strength. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to need that file. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I think I got a shout out in like the intro or something. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that story. I don't think I heard it before. Um, well, let me just do a little recap. So one more time, one more kind of stack on the pyramid. So the bottom of the pyramid is clear beliefs, I'm sorry, clear core beliefs about your training. What do you believe about training? Then the second level of pyramid is what is your approach to training? How do you translate that into like how you actually do the, the training on the floor? The third level of the pyramid is what's in your exercise library. Do you have a library that makes it clear the exercises you do or don't do? Next level on top of that is what is your proven process for writing programs? Do you have shared templates? Or is your whole team on the same page about how what the format and structure of programming is? And then the top of the pyramid is is all this work you're doing to create great programs for clients actually getting them results, <laughs> right? So are you actually following up with clients in the, in the form of uh, check-in sessions or goal setting sessions or monthly challenges or some form of accountability coaching? Is someone connecting with your clients to see, are you actually getting the results you came here for? Because if not, <laughs> all that work we just talked about is for nothing. If it does actually translate to moving the needle for the people who are paying us. And so, you know, how do you all make sure your clients are getting a good experience and getting results, Pete? We have the, I, don't, I wouldn't say good fortune because it is probably my my biggest headache in the gym, but the, the seasonality of my business requires mm -hmm. that people come and go. Yeah. So we are able to reevaluate because it, it makes sense logically within the calendar, typically two and sometimes three times a year. Yep. And it just, it forces our hand on that conversation. It's yeah. hard not to say, what have we done in the past? What did you like? What did you not like? What can we change? What exercises gave you difficulty or did you feel pain? What yeah. equipment li limitations did you have? And so these conversations have to happen for us to re-onboard clients who are coming out of uh, seasons when they're coming yeah. back to us with additional free time. So whether I want to do it or not, we didn't systemize it because we were smart people who were like, all right, this is how we're going to keep our finger on the pulse of our effectiveness. Yeah, It was just the unfortunate Built reality of the, working with a yeah. very specific athletic population. Yeah. Well, honestly, listeners, you don't have to have a seasonal athletic population to use that strategy, right? You can just build it in. You can say as a, as a general pop audience, every spring and fall, everyone in the gym does some sort of assessment. Everyone does, whether it's a, um, a in-body machine or, uh, or tracks the results for a week, or if people who want fat loss actually, you know, uh, get on a, um, do a pictures like before and after pictures, right? There's lots of ways to see if people are getting results. You could even just send a simple survey uh, a few times per year. But there's got to be some way where you close that feedback loop and say, okay, so what we're doing for all of our clients actually making the difference that they want it to make, that they came here for. Uh, and if not, we've built a program design system that doesn't actually serve the people we want to serve. <laughs> so like that last piece is really critical. Um, all right. So that's, that's our program design pyramid. Um, I think all the examples you gave Pete were really great, but anything else about simplifying streamlining program design that you want to share? Maybe not so much simplifying and streamlining, but I want to make one very, very important point is that you can't treat this as one and done. So yeah. you you can't create your video database and then walk away from it. You yeah. can't create your programming template or SOP and then walk away from it. You actually do have to have a scheduled approach to revisiting what is and is not working as a team. Yeah. And we, in our case, that means updating our video database two, sometimes three times a year. Because yeah. the reality is if we're doing a good job, we're learning. And if we're learning, we're introducing new material and phasing out old material. But with two facilities doing that, with two full teams doing that simultaneously, it's almost impossible to have uniformity in our programming language year round without yes. working on it. Yeah. And so just well in the last week, I got an updated video database link from Eric saying, can, can everybody up there agree to start using this one? Great. And, and we have to just 
stay on top of the terminology we use. We need to talk about what the team likes and doesn't like. Yep. So, you know, staff members are going to introduce training concepts that the other team members don't always completely believe in. We need yep. to get buy-in from the whole group. So my point is just, this is this is something that needs to be structured in our approach to revisiting the discussion. And it's yeah. an uncomfortable conversation sometimes. Yeah. I'm not going to say you more know. often than not, but it is no, a challenge. It can be. People have strongly held convictions and beliefs about what's right and not right in training land, if really for or against exercises or general approaches in general. And we've had a lot of um, tension-filled conversations at MFF, and we do something very similar, which is at least once a year, the MFF training team goes through all of our coaching SOPs, all of our SOPs related to program design and how we serve our clients. And we all kind of as a team audit all of our SOPs kind of once a year, including the ones for program design. And staying on top of it um, is true for all the SOPs piece in your business. The SOPs have to represent your team's current best thinking on any given topic. And I think program design, as Pete just said, is one of those topics where if your team is full of learners and you know lifelong learners going to conferences, doing certifications, their ideas about it are going to keep changing and evolving. So making sure that your SOPs are not always changing, but changing in the most meaningful ways to represent everyone's best thinking, like it's critical. It's critical and it never ends. It never ends. Yeah. Um, well, let's leave it there, even though it's maybe a bummer of an idea. <laughs> I think it's the truth. We'll leave you with the truth. <laughs> and I think truth, no, all right, I'll leave you with a good one. A tip <laughs> that I saw learned in real time in the last, yeah. I think, two or three years. Yeah. John showed up to deliver an in-service and he was prepared to introduce some material to the interns. And then our office manager said, hey, so-and-so needs a new program and it didn't get put on your to-do list. Mm. They're going to be here in the next half hour. And John looked at the interns and he was like, hey, this one's kind of more important than the continuing ed in this given moment. How do you guys feel about me putting it up on the big screen? And I'm going to write a program and you're allowed to ask me questions in real time about where my head is going with it. Great. And so they were all like, OK. And so Amazing. John wrote a program with the projector going, basically. And in some circumstances, they asked questions and others. He said, you know, no one's asking this, but here's why I'm pairing this with this. Sure. based on whatever it is, his existing knowledge of the client. And he finished, got the program done in time. And he said to the group, he's like, hey, I'm sorry for throwing you guys a curveball today. Did you guys like it? Did you hate it? And they, as a group said, if you did this for every in-service for the rest of the time we are interns here at CSP, we would find it valuable. Worth it. Yeah. And so, it. I mean, I can't say that he's built it into like a constant routine, but I know that one of the best ways to teach is by by doing in yeah. front of other people and then allowing to say, Hey, hey, pause. What are you thinking when you do that? Yeah. So something to think that. about in your own space. I think it's a great story to end with, right? It really speaks to the idea of like uh, you as the owner, if this is all stuck in your head, you got to get it out. And that's a great example of how to get it out and shared into conversation. So awesome. Well, thanks, Pete. A great conversation as always, dear listeners. We hope you're walking away with some uh, solutions for how to simplify and streamline and build sustainable, scalable program design systems. Uh, and um, and as a one final reminder, if you're listening to this podcast before January 14th, um, go over to our Instagram and let us know you want to join us in Austin. We'll give you more information about Austin, and we hope to see you there at the retreat. It's going to be badass. Uh, be thanks there. for a great call, Pete. See you on the next one. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.